Wir sind das Dart-Team von Gott. Und Town TV ist wonderful! Town TV, what a jolly good show! <lacht> Well, good morning, viewers. Uh, this is rather somewhat an unusual occasion because uh, here we are, and we're not in Brighton, and we're not in Southsea, and we're not off the Isle of Wight anyway. We're actually at the Hook of Holland, and behind me is the Dutch skyline just coming up. It's some ridiculous early hours, about half past six in the morning, and Town TV are on assignment to Holland. So we just thought we'd bring some of the day's events, and... Uh, Hopefully next time you come for, to Holland for a holiday, you'll know all about it. I, I'm, at least I'm sure that uh, Steve and Howard will. <laughs> Aren't you, Steve? It's cold. It's, it's very cold. He's got very watery eyes, but he's doing very well. What a hero. Anyway, thanks a lot, Town TV viewers. We'll see you later. And the skyline you can see is Rotterdam. Now, we can't see any English football supporters. They're in those trucks over there. They're in those trucks over there. <laughs> in those containers. Same being shipped back. <laughs> but, um, considering all the aggravation of last week in Rotterdam, everybody's very, very nice to us. But um, it's a bit industrial with Rotterdam, but we're going to uh, show you some countryside in a minute. Because we're on our way past Amsterdam and up to the north of Holland. So we'll keep, we'll keep bringing you a roving report. Now Steve has just said we're going back under the bridge, so uh, hopefully we'll point in the right direction. <laughs> Yeah, nice, nice attacking play. There's Calvin up there, in the front. Throw into Andover. Oh, lovely ball play there. But unfortunately, ride supports so are away again. Knocking the ball across the park. and they were looking very strong in attack here. Yeah. Well, it's Ken Cunningham Brown here. Ken, how's it going this afternoon? Well, we're winning 2-0, but I think we're making hard work of it. Yeah? yeah. What, are, what are rides for, say? I think they're good. They're playing good football. Yeah. They're keeping it on the ground, you know. They're relying, they're playing five at the back and they're relying on hoofing it down to the fast guy up the front, you know. But having said that, they are keeping the ball a lot of time on the ground. So who scored the goals this afternoon? Um, Gary um, Lewis and John Gommershall. I thought John Gommershall's goal who was the turning point in the game for the first half. Yeah. And he scored an excellent goal. I mean, we went round three people and shot, you know. Yeah. Brilliant goal. So how have, how have Andover been doing this season? We, we, we were here a couple of weeks ago, but how have they been doing so? Well, I think we're doing very well, actually. <laughs> you know. um, What's the position in the league? Um, we're about um, seven from the top, but we've got games in hand. And if we won the games in hand, we'd probably be second or third. Right, right. So we're on target to try and win the league. Yeah. So how do you think this is going to go this afternoon? Well, <laughs> you're, you're two nil up, so... <laughs> I'd be disappointed if you don't get four goals. Well, that was Ken Cunningham-Brown, the Andover manager, and uh, 
That's why horse trainer as well. We saw at Salisbury races a couple of weeks ago. But Ander were definitely doing very well, playing some very attacking football. Come on! Come on, go! A nice move here. Coming in up there. Oh. Right, it's quite interesting this afternoon. We've got a woman referee, Wendy Toms, who's uh, obviously managing the game very well. And we've only just picked up on that, and I think it's the uh, first time I've ever seen a woman referee, but she's doing a grand job. And of course she would. Yeah! Great goal there from Andover. 3 0. You're playing some great football at the moment, though. I've seen some, some of your goals absolutely brilliant. So uh, it must be great fun, really, to be playing here. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. And sorry, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't score before I came off, but I have to rest, you know, the hamstring and so. Because a bit sore. Yeah, what's the problem with the hamstring? Well, I got a strain on the last game against Eastleigh, and you know, I'm a bit sore, all sore still. Yeah. Yeah, so I have to still rest and see how it goes, you know? Because we have a game on Tuesday. You scored some goals there? <laughs> yeah, we just scored one, yeah. <laughs> so what's yeah, the score now? The score is four, yeah, four nil, yeah. Just yeah. scored by Gomashal. He scored two, and I guess Lewis scored the other two, yeah. yeah he's doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,. I hear some scouts were up looking at you the other day from Southampton, is that what somebody said? Yeah, so I understand some scouts from Southampton, yeah, yeah and Bournemouth, I think. Yeah. I understand they were interested, but still holding a wait on and see what will be the outcome of it, you know. That's great. So it because, must, be, must be pretty exciting for you anyway. Yeah, pretty exciting, yeah, because I hope to play professional football and decide to work hard to, see, to get sure. to the top there. Yeah. Yep. Well, Ken, that must be pretty exciting for you, 4 0. Yep. That's what we said a while ago, wasn't it? We wanted four goals and That's we've right. got them. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Well done. So, if I never keep playing like that, you're going to be doing really well. Yep. I think if we can keep going, we, we should be, you know, either win the, champ, the league or be very close to it. Well, That's brilliant. our ambition. Anyway. Brilliant. Anyway, you keep playing this attacking football. It's absolutely amazing. What we need is goals and winners. <laughs> goals. <laughs> yeah, goals and winners. Yeah. Oh, well, best of luck. Thanks for Thanks talking very to much. us. Yeah, cheers, Bye. Ken. Oakley Cleaners, Andover's foremost independent dry cleaners. And as such, your complete satisfaction with our service is of paramount importance. Mention Town TV and for a limited period only, we will process one item free with every five pounds you spend on personal dry cleaning. And remember to ask about our regular customer discount scheme. Oakley Cleaners, Wayhill Road, Andover. Well, here we are at the Westbury uh, Trading Estate, which is the headquarters of Marcus. And uh, we've got Jem Marsh, the founder of the company. Jem, tell me how Marcus got going. It started in 1959. I met uh, a man called Frank Costin, who was the original designer of the Fanwell body in Lotus Aerodynamics, etc. And we pre he had made a wooden car, and I was particularly interested in this because I was keen on woodwork, and it was one of the few exams I passed at school. And, uh, so we set about making a wooden Marcos, and that's how it started. 
The name, of course, is half my name and half Costin's name, M-A-R-C-O-S, that's how it's named. Nothing to do with the Philippines whatsoever. Oh, right. <laughs> so when did you go into production of, of cars? 1960. Late 59, early 60, we started making, producing the car which you saw on the bit of film regarding the, the Jackie Stewart car. It was oh, right. that type, exactly. Yeah, yeah, OK. So um, what, what's been the story of the company since, since those early days? Well, in 1960... Uh, 61, Frank Costin left the company and Dennis Adams moved in and he is the man really is responsible for the shape of the current cars, all of them really, ever since 1962. He, from the Costin, original Costin shape, he created cars, different shapes, until we produced the fabulous 1863 and then from then we've transformed the car into the, the, the Mantara as you now have seen today which is, again, Dennis Adams' reworking of the original styling. Yeah. And, he, of course, he's been also responsible for the new GT car. Now we're in the Marcus Cars fiberglass shop, yeah. where all the fiberglass parts are made, including, of course, the main body shell and the under tray. Right. And, obviously, these are in uh, early stages of production, so can you, can you just show us, really, what's, what's happening? Yes, this uh, is the under tray mould here, yeah. and this is done in, uh, uh, it's white because it's done with a fireproof resin, mm. and we need that for the German market. Right, oh, I see. Right, this is the main body mould here, which the actual body's cast inside, moulded inside this body here, in this mould, and uh, it has to be taken to pieces, obviously, to get the body out. The body has just been taken out of this mould, and has been taken over to the trim shop to be trimmed. There's one here on the right, which you can see here, which is actually still in the mould, and you can see the actual body still inside the mould. And you undo these bolts here, and then it releases the body from the mould. This mould here is in fact the new mould for the new car, which is being launched at the Motor Show on the 20th of uh, October. Well, we're now in the uh, metalwork shop, the fabrication shop, where all the fabrication is carried out for the Marcos chassis, wishbones, suspension, pedal assemblies, window frames. We make everything we can. This is an interesting feature of the Marcos Mantara. It uh, has fully adjustable pedals. These pedals slide up and down on this screwed rod here. So instead of having a moving seat, you can adjust the pedals to suit the perfect driving position. So one of the few cars in the world that has this. And that's a sample of our fabrication work. That is the lower rear wishbone. As you can see, it's all made of uh, high quality tubing, machine bushes, etc. And that's, uh, that is actually one of the production items of the car. Uh, this is a trim shop where the bodies come out of the fiberglass moulds and they come in here to have the furry edges trimmed off and finalise it, putting onto the chassis in okay. here. This is, a, this is a spider here, which has the body fitted to the chassis, all right? And already, prior to putting the body on, the brake pipes are fitted and the fuel lines are fitted to the rear and also the rear suspension is fitted on before we put the body on. Right. It now goes from here, after it's been fully trimmed, uh, into the paint shop. Yeah. The cars are firstly baked, the fiberglass is baked first and then it's flattened down and then primers put on and then, then it's painted and then baked again. You have to bake fiberglass to ensure it's fully cured before it goes into the final assembly shop. This car here is the Mini Marcos, and this, these we uh, are fully built here and are shipped out to Japan. We supply them to Japan. The Japanese are very keen on the, on the Mini Marcos. This is a, a, a paint mixing scheme. Um, there are over 800 different colors of cars, at least, and with this paint, mixing scheme we can in fact mix any colour that we like to suit the customer's needs. This car here which is actually in just for 
a polish up but it's going to the motor show and in fact fitted with a 4.5 engine giving 300 horsepower and this particular model achieved 0 to 60 in 4.65 seconds and a top speed of over 150. And it is of course fitted with a Rover engine uh, altered to give you a capacity of 4.5 litres. And also you can see in the engine that it's fitted with air conditioning as well. So this car has air conditioning and power steering and you can see on the front of the bonnet the spare wheel is under the bonnet which of course gives us a very large boot capacity of nearly six cubic feet so you can fit two sets of golf clubs in and two trolleys. This car here is one that we're building for the Dubai Motor Show. It's our first car to the Middle East. We have orders for several cars and it'll be leaving uh, next Tuesday by sea for the Dubai show which opens on November the 23rd. And this car actually is fitted with special air conditioning for the, for the um, extra heat special radiator and is a coupe of course because with a very high heat out there the, the soft tops are a bit too hot to drive around in so they, they all go for the coupes. But as you can see it's nearly finished now and uh, it's all ready to go. This car here is a left hand drive one which is going to Germany and is for the Essen Motor Show. It's fitted with a 3.9 Rover engine with TUV approved wheels. Everything has to conform to German regulations of which this car does. Now this car will be finished and will be going out on Wednesday of next week. Our German import is picking it up. This car here is being built for the Earl's Court Motor Show. It's, once again it's fitted with air conditioning and it's been done in a special color which we all like, think it's wonderful and has an, an exotic pink up, leather upholstery to match the bodywork. This will be finished in, uh, this car will be finished by my Monday to be shipped off to, um, to, the, to the motor show. They're assembling the doors for this same car. They put the door locks on and the mirrors and then rehang the doors on and fit the window frames in. Right, th this is the car which is being unveiled at the motor show at 11 o'clock on Wednesday the 20th next week and has been built from scratch in approximately eight weeks. It is fitted with a Rover engine, V8, giving 450 horsepower, special brakes as you can see, four pot calipers, uh, there's a certain amount of Kevlar and high technology fiberglass have been adapted to the under tray to give you extra chassis stiffness. And of course you've got the, at the front, the, the air comes in through the front and out through the top of the bonnet, which gives you the downforce at the front, and then you have a spoiler at the back, the downforce at the rear. This car will go in excess of 200 miles an hour. But it is based on our current road car, so that we are in fact producing road versions of this model for the general public if they want to buy one for the road. And it will be type approved. And what will the bomb that set them back? You went to the price, yeah? Forty-five thousand pounds for a road right. model. Yeah, no, that's not bad, is it? No. Right, this is the trim. We do all our own trim here. We find that if we do it ourselves, it's done properly. And we have a couple of sewing machines. And this is the centre console where the gear stick comes out. There's your switches for your electric mirrors, heated electric mirrors. There's your window switches there. And then, of course, your air comes out of there from the air conditioning. The radio goes in there. The handbrake out of here. This is the, the, the leather seats, it's all leather, and we have a, an extra, this is a seat here which goes in behind the existing seat just in front of you for drivers of low stature. And here you can see that all the various panels are made up, it's all leather, and they're padded, fluted, and then stitched together into the, to make up the whole seats. All these parts here are pre-made, ready to sew up. Um, this is an example of our Wilton carpet, which we fit to all the cars, and uh, it, it, we actually purchased it, of course, from Wilton as we're very near. Yeah. It's amazing, I think people realise that uh, such high quality goes into the cars. And Wilson carpets and leather and hand stitch, and it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful way to make a motor car. Well, we're an hour and uh, hour and a half 
up on the, down the road, or should I say up the road, because we're, we're driving from northern Holland uh, to a town near Groningen. And the reason for this trip may seem a bit obscure, but what we're doing is going to where they make the fiberglass, which makes the Marcus racing car. And we've been invited up here by PPG, uh, one of the world's biggest industrial companies, who make fiberglass. And we're going to go and see them make it. And then when we get back to England, you'll see how it all works in the Marcus racing car when we get to World's Court on Wednesday. <laughs> So uh, the scenery now has become very flat, but it's very beautiful and green. Lots of lots of lots of lakes. Right here we are, everybody. On, we're on on the side of a Dutch canal, and uh, there's what are they called? Windmills. Windmills. There's windmills to the left of us, and there's windmills to the right of us, and there's cars in the field and water, and it's all looking very Dutch, and uh, it's really quite nice. What do you think of it so far? I mean, so far it's fairly impressive. I mean, I've been down. I've got to crouch down. <laughs> yeah, right. See, I'm too tall, viewers, you see. I need to cut something off of my legs. No, I mean, I've been to Holland a couple of times, but I haven't actually been this far out into the countryside. It's absolutely flat and gorgeous. I mean, there were so many greenhouses as we were coming away from the port. It was absolutely amazing. It's beautiful. It's very green as well. It's quite chilly, but it's uh, really quite nice and... It's very fresh. Quite nice and warm. Definitely very fresh. And, uh, anyway, we're now going to go on to the factory, which I'm sure will be a little bit different to these beautiful green fields, but uh, we'll see you there in a minute. Right. I also think this place is quite flat, quite flat as well. He's nicked me microphone! He can hear me. Wait. He's been talking all the way from the Hook of Holland viewers, so don't listen to him. TV expose. Well, not really an expose, but we've heard today that uh, Tony Murray, an ex Trog, is being interviewed by the Trogs fan club. Go away. <laughs> Go away. Get out of here. This is the a legendary Tony Murray, the best bass guitarist in the world. And I want to know what you're doing here today, Mr. Murray. Go away. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. He's not going to say anything. He's not going to say anything, but what we're going to do now is go and see um, these two people here. And can you, can you, um, what are you doing today in the Royal Oak at Charlton? I don't need this. <laughs> I really don't yeah, need yeah, this. Porn. Tony TV does. Came down to see Tony as an ex-member of the Trogs. Yeah. And uh, I run the Trogs fan club. And uh, obviously fans want to know what he's up to these days. And uh, a few stories, the cleaner ones, uh, from oh, when right. he was with the Trogs. And who's this gentleman here? Oh, uh, no, just... Hi, hi. And that's our T-shirts. I didn't get your name. I'm Jacqueline. Jacqueline? Yeah. Jacqueline? Jacqueline. Jacqueline, yeah. yeah. So how is the Trogs fan club doing? Very well. Got members from the States, all over Europe, Germany, France, Holland, Ukraine. Belgium, Ukraine, yeah. Uh, and of course the UK. It's flourishing. And what do they think of Reg? Do a Reg oh, with the corn circles. What do you think about the corn circles? I think there might be something in it. Oh yes, oh yes, I'm quite interested, yes. Yeah, we were talking with Pete Lucas in the week, and uh, he was quite keen. He told me he just joined the Tremlows, actually, but I think I'm on maybe a vicious rumour. No, I think it's a vicious rumour, actually, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Really? Yeah. So, are you busy? I mean, are yeah. the, is the Trogs fan club still yeah. really going well? I'm still getting inquiries, yeah. Even though they haven't worked in the UK for six months, they've been in Germany an awful long, uh, lot, and uh, they've all had the holidays at the moment. But, uh, yeah, yeah, still getting inquiries, which is great. Dave, Dave Wright, to all you Andover viewers. You probably know Dave, right? Well, you've seen him around the town enough. Hi. But um, Dave can tell us a real story of the Trogs because in this very garden, we all used to meet at, uh, from White Cottage, which is just, up, just up the road. Yep. And uh, I've got photographs of Stan and all the lads yep. at this place. So tell me a bit about uh, Stan Phillips, Dave. Well, he was responsible for the, the Trogs, really. I went down there to, for my interview, for my um, audition. Stan was there, Stan was responsible for everything, I, and I passed the audition, and I was one of the original Trogs, I'm pleased to say. That's right. And there's a photograph of you, isn't there? And there's a, <laughs> a, I am actually in the Andover Museum, I know I'm old, but not that old, but I'm in the Andover Museum as one of the original, there's a picture of the original Trogs, and that's where I am. That's right. So if you want to go into the Andover Museum to see me, you can. But Charlton was quite special, wasn't it? Because I mean, Charlton was uh, special. Really, I mean, Stan Phillips was... The, the man who got everything Aye, running, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, he got everything running. There was yeah. one person that, if it hadn't been Stan Phillips, there would have been 
No trogs. Yeah. And trogs are now. That's right. Everything there is. Yeah, courtesy. All over the world. Exactly, courtesy of Stan. Yeah. Courtesy of Stan Phillips. Yeah, that's right. But used to be some great times at White Cottage. We've seen a few things happen there. We, we? certainly have. Yeah. <laughs> We can't even, can, can we, we can't, can we? We can't, no, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. But in, but uh, in following programs, we're going to do a little thing on White Cottage and uh, how important it was. Good, and, and the rock and roll history. Yeah. I, I, I don't think probably people realise how big trogs have become since. That's right. Since they, since they were, they were famous at their, at their prime, but I think in retrospect now, looking back on it, they're bigger now than they probably even were in, in the times that, mm, that's true. that we, we knew them. You know, even kids of today, it's a, we do wild thing. The band that we're in, we do wild thing. Yeah. And it's the the the, the end of our anth. It is That's the right. end of our anthem. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. you couldn't get any better than that, could you? I don't. As you say, I don't think people realise that how important White Cottage was. Nope. Um, I've seen the Bee Gees there. Bee Gees. Everybody. Everybody. You name Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney's been there. Everybody you could Rod think Stewart. of. Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. Dave D. Dozier. Yeah. Everybody you could think. I've been to White, White Cottage, Cottage parties and things and for. Yeah. Business talks, etc. Yeah. yeah, Stan put Stan really did put the, the, right. the trogs and and they were on the map. On the map. Yeah. And we're gonna have to thank him for it. That's right. A blessing. Yeah, we miss him dearly. We're here on a beautiful sunny day in Holland. Um, can you tell me what PPG do here? This is the PPG fiberglass plant, as you can see. We, yeah. we manufacture glass fiber yeah. inside this plant. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in here, the, the PPG plant? Well, it was established in 1963. Yeah. It was a joint venture from PPG and yeah. EXO. Yeah. And now it's PPG since two and a half years. Great. So how many people have you got working here? About 850. 850? Yes. So you're a very big employer in the area. Oh, yes, yes. we are indeed. <laughs> yes. So 
what actually happens here? You actually you make, make fiberglass from raw materials? Yes, fiberglass mainly uh, used for the reinforcement of plastics. Of plastics, yes. okay. So you're going to show us around, and we're going to see some of, the, uh, some of it being made. I'll show you how we make glass fiber. Fantastic. Um, what are we looking at here? Eddie? We look you know, at, the, at the silos yeah. in which we put the raw materials. Oh, this is the place where raw materials are mixed to the beds. From the beds we make uh, glass. Well, what we see here is, is a, a furnace. A very big one, as you yeah, can see. It certainly <laughs> is. Yeah. And this is where all the beds is melted. Yeah. At about uh, 1600 degrees uh, Celsius. And the beds is melted into glass. It's getting really hot here, 1600 degrees Celsius inside. And here below we have uh, the so-called farming department, where the filaments are pulled out of the furnace. We have two furnaces here, in this area. Hot, uh, this is another very, very hot furnace, isn't it? Oh, very hot, yeah. yeah. That's a lovely day, it's a very hot furnace. On a cold day, it would be nice to curl up yeah. in front of. Eddie, so when did fiberglass start? Oh, it's a rather new technology. It started in the, in the 30s of this century, so about 60 years ago. It's a, it's a new technology. We still have developments in this industry. Yeah. It's a young industry. Yeah. You certainly do have some developments. Yes. It's amazing. Well, I guess you could call this the machine room of PPG here in uh, Holland. This is where all the spinning's done, and from that furnace emerges all this glass fiber in strands. So now we're looking at the process here now. Uh, what you see now is the spinning department. Yeah. This is where uh, glass filaments come out of the furnace. These filaments have a diameter from 9 to 20 micron. So that is uh, very thin. Yes. The special uh, coating is put on the glass fiber. That's very important. Special uh, size. Well, what you see there up there is that the glass is coming out of the furnace through the bushings. And the bushing has very thin holes from 9 to 20 millimeter. And uh, the filaments are pulled out of the furnace through here. Here is some coating put on the on the glass. And it is here. Here you see the spin cakes. Spin cakes are put on these uh, special wagons and we uh, put them further into the plant for, well, then we get uh, further production into roving, shop strands, textile yarns and so on. When the spin cakes come from, uh, from the farming department, they are still wet and they must be dried yeah. and we do that in these uh, ovens yeah. and that takes several hours. Right. So they come out uh, completely dry. Right. Here we have our spin cakes again. And you see how these bundles of uh, glass are put, are led through that uh, roving binder, cables of uh, fiberglass. And that is where the roving is made. 
which you can find back in that famous car. <laughs> so Eddie, I, I guess this is a final point in the, the whole process. Oh yes, it is. This is, uh, this is the warehouse yeah. and from here the products go to all the countries, mostly West Europe, right. but also worldwide. Right. So we've seen the, uh, the roving and the fiberglass come right from the beginning, right from the sun, right the way through, and now it's ended up in cardboard boxes. Yes, and, it's, it is. and off it goes. So uh, thank you very much for the tour around anyway. It's been uh, absolutely fantastic. The car uh, body and the tub as light as possible, so we've utilised the, uh, the modern non-crimp glass fibre fabrics where the, where the uh, unidirectional properties of fibreglass are used to their best ability. So we've shaved some weight off, but uh, also made it stronger and stiffer at the same time. And uh, hopefully we're going to see uh, a reduction in the time taken to build the thing as well. Okay, well this is the, uh, this is the car we've come down to see, the absolutely stunning Marcus Le Mans GT car and uh, we've been told it's going to do 200 miles an hour, or in excess of 200 miles an hour. Heading towards Amsterdam after a very nice visit to uh, the factory, PPGs. Eddie looked after us very well. We had some lunch though with the workers, well, because we are workers, and uh, all in all, a very successful shoot. Steve's still suffering from motion sickness, so he tells me, but I think it was the vodka he had last night. The sun's still shining, and we're about 180 kilometers from Amsterdam, getting back from the north of Holland. So we're going to try and find you some more water, some more windmills, and some more Dutch barns. So, uh, just stick with us, we'll keep bringing the news as it happens. Good evening. This is the time for ghosts and ghouls. Around Halloween, they lurk around schools. This is one of the most haunted roads in Andover. It's called Rat Close. And on a Christmas Eve, late at night, in the early hours of Christmas Day, if it snows, you will see paw marks in the snow. And there also, you will see blood by each paw mark as it goes down to the bottom. But let's see what happens at a pub in Andover. Over 230 years ago, something very strange happened in this pub, the Globe. And in fact, something still strange happens today in that room across the courtyard. So Peter, can you tell us what actually happened here about 230 years ago? Well, it is reported that in 1763, a niece of the, the landlord here, a, actually one Elizabeth Atkins, um, actually married a French prisoner of war. Uh, she went over to France to live, um, had a baby called uh, Jean-Baptiste, and during the French Revolution, it was, you know, the son, Jean-Baptiste, who actually... Um, as she saw the king, actually Louis the Sixteenth, escaping mm -hmm. from France, and he actually gave him away, which actually resulted in him actually being, you know, guillotined. Right. And, so, 
Um, from then on, what happened? I mean, the, well, was... she came back home to England in a disgrace, and she lived back here, you know, with uh, her uncle, and as she ended her days here, and it is said she still roams around uh, this place here. Um, where does this take place? Can we have a look at the You can room? have a look, yeah, if you dare to follow me, by oh. all means. We're, we're, we'll follow you all right. Yeah. You're first. <laughs> We've now driven 514 miles and we're, in actual fact, about 20 kilometres from the Hook of Holland. I trust you enjoyed the scenic tour of uh, Amsterdam, wasn't it? Yes, I trust you enjoyed the scenic tour of Amsterdam. And now we've got a beautiful, glorious sunset coming in over the North Sea. And uh, it's really quite gorgeous. And we've had a great day and I thoroughly recommend all of you viewers to come to Holland. And um, have you guys enjoyed it? Yeah. Absolutely yeah. Way Very good. Yeah. And when you consider we've done all this in one day, from the hook of Holland up to the north of Holland, whizzing back again through Amsterdam. Nice bridge. And they've got a nice bridge there too. Through Rotterdam, done the whole of Holland in one day. So 540 miles later, here we are. Good morning, Town TV viewers. It's what's the time, Hyde? About half past seven. Yeah, about half past seven. Yeah, we just got off the Stena Britannica from the Hook of Holland, and it's a very cold Tuesday morning in Harwich. But it just proves that you can go to northern Holland and back in the space of I don't know how many hours is it? I don't know, 36 hours, something like that. But it wasn't that long. Was it? Right, we're now on the Porsche stand, and behind us are some most beautiful Porsches. And we've got all the celebrities up here, John Regis and a lot of the silver medal, gold medal athletes from uh, the uh, European Championships. But the show is incredible, and there's some incredible cars here. Incredible Porsches, lovely Ferraris, Toyotas, Jeeps, Lotus, AC cars, Caterham cars, Mazda, Seats. John, John Zamet, PR manager from Sayat. Hi there. Hi, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. Are you having a good motor show so far? Uh, first day. Excellent, but... excellent. Our yeah. biggest stand ever, actually, in the, in the UK since imports began in 86. So tell me about the new car. It looks sensational. Well, it's brand new from the ground up. The only thing it carries from the vehicle it replaces is its name. And it's got a brand new chassis platform. Ten models in the UK now go on sale in just a few days' time. Yeah diesels and petrol engines, including the 2-litre GTI that you see behind me. Yeah. Um, big things with this car are refinement, uh, handling and passive safety. Who designed it? The design is quite incredible, I think. It's, yeah, it's very pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Gigiaro of Italy, it's uh, our design. Got it. Got it. Um, and it's a very slippery shape, it's an uh, efficient shape as well as looking good. Yeah, right. And the paintwork looks amazing too, the colour is great. Yeah. Ferrari red on this. <laughs> uh, we call it Tornado red, actually. <laughs> tornado red. Yeah, it comes at a slightly extra price, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's worth the money, I think. So what's the performance on the GTI? Uh, 0 to 60 in just under the 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, but it's, the big thing about the car, as I say, is its refinement. It's not out and out pace, but the fact that its cabin noise is very well suppressed. So you've got a car that's fun to drive, but it doesn't raffle your nerves, you know. Okay, well, thanks very much for talking to us, and I congratulate you on that car. It's very, very nice indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. 
Right, Richard Mackay, Managing Director. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah. So how's your motor show gone for you? Press time? Well, early days yet, yeah. but uh, tremendously well. I think it'll be a really good show. Yeah. And uh, particularly for us, we're in a marvellous position here. So, yeah. uh, Tell me something about this monster behind us. I'm just going to turn around a bit so the viewers can right. see. <laughs> it's, uh, that is a, a, a one-off at the moment. It's a prototype, which is the Viper GTS Coupe. You've probably heard about the Viper Roadster, which we have an example elsewhere on the stand. Uh, that has been built uh, by the Americans as a prototype, and I genuinely do believe that they will go into production with it. It's uh, 400 brake horsepower, 8 litre V10, uh, uh, two door, two seat coupe. It's been a great success story. The, uh... the Viper? The Viper has, for Chrysler, uh, been an enormous success story. It's produced so much goodwill, so much publicity for the company. Yeah. Now, here we are in the 348, supercar. Super lines, lovely red colour. Howard likes red colours. Um, I used to own a 308 GT4, and this is a really super car. It's the updated version of it. So uh, we're gonna have a look around. We may see a little test film of the Ferrari in action. Might be hard. Might be. Might be, be, uh, nice. be really nice. So we'll be coming back to you in a minute. Well, hello, viewers. We've, we've come all the way from Holland, and now here we are at the motor show. And in front of us, you see the Marcus Mantara. We're actually on the Marcus stand. We're, we're just awaiting the, um, the unveiling of the new GT car, which is just behind me. And uh, I'm sure when Steve has finished swooping all over the Marcus Mantara, he'll film the GT car, <laughs> won't you, Steve? But in the background there is the... Is the uh, the veiled new Marcus GT cars, the one we're filming down in uh, Westbury in Wiltshire, and the one we've travelled to Holland to actually watch them making the fiberglass. So. Obviously, as it's press day at the motor show, it's not so many people around as if it was normal, the normal punter's day. But it uh, gives us a bit more space to show you what actually goes on behind the scenes here. It's quite nerve wracking on the stand. We're about 20 minutes now away from the unveiling hour. How do you feel about this, the unveiling of the car? Oh, it's great. It's tremendous. We're yeah. delighted with our stand, and we already had a lot of press coming around, collecting press packs, and I'm sure when we unveil the car, we shall get a tremendous amount of publicity and to help the company along its way towards our ultimate goal of running at Le Mans. Quite an important day in your life. It's very important, yes, to launch a new car. Well, we've got Dennis Adams, the designer of the Marcus cars. Dennis, you started in the early days with Gems. Oh yes, 1959. Yeah. Um, I'd come from a racing team, Lister yeah. Jaguar, before yeah. that, and uh, got in touch with Gem um, through a mutual friend, Frank Costin, yeah. the COS in Marcos, and before you knew it, Frank and I were building the first of them, and uh, after a very short time, um, I got to be chief designer man of the whole lot of them. 1962 was this particular model yeah. that was here, yeah. even though we've modified it a lot of times. Yeah. Um, but you've got to modify. I mean, the first car had a little side valve engine in. Well, you know, they're in museums now, so you're forced to. But we could have totally redesigned it from scratch, you know, and kept up with the Japs, what they've done. Um, but we wanted, in a way, to do a little bit of a Morgan, if you can put it that way, and keep traditional, keep a little classic. But um, some people actually do criticise that. Uh, we'll see. What are your reactions this morning? Are you nervous, excited, or...? Well, you do get a bit of that anyway. Yeah. From my point of view, you know, the, 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 the thing that you dread is if everybody comes up, you know, and go, oh my God, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so then you decide to disclaim it or blame it on somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus stand. We're delighted to 
invited me over to launch our new car here at the London Motor Show. Some of you may know, we used to use race internationally back in the 60s with considerable success in the GT category. We felt the time was right to compete once again with a car that's eligible for the BRDC Challenge. The cha championship is the epitome of what GT racing used to be like in the 70s. How do you think it went today? Marvellous. Yeah? Excellent. Yeah? We followed a few round, you know, the press, the television, the whole lot, stand to stand to stand, and many of them suddenly come from under wraps. Everybody turned and walked away. Yeah, yeah. There were some appreciation, you know, for a few of them, but this one actually got a round of applause, and everybody stayed. Somebody said to me it looks very British. Is that right? Good, I hope it does look very British. That's why we put the Union Jack on it. It has a British engine, British chassis, all made in Britain. Nothing, even the, even the instruments are made in this country. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, a good designer man, and I'm not modest, um, can make a thing look British if he yeah. wants to make it look British. Yeah. And yeah. it is easy if you are British anyway, yeah. you know, to make your traditional British sports car. That's right. That, 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 in a way, you could say that's a myth, what is the British yeah. sports car. Yeah. Here we are, 30, 30 years later. It's going to be a great day in your life, Dennis. Well, yeah. Um, naturally, we're always looking for the next one. Yeah. You see, this now is, to me, this is over. It's finished. Right. You know, the paper's all screwed up and chucked in the rubbish bin. We're now a clean sheet of paper and ready to start again. Right. But now his work starts. That's right. Yeah, he's going to sell it to us and race it. <laughs> yeah, we'll sell and race this one. And yeah. maybe, maybe Dennis and I will get together and create something which will astound the whole world with a new shape, which won't be... Five hundred thousand pounds, like certain supercars on the market. Anyway, thanks very much for talking to us. It's been a great day, it's been a great day for us, and a great day for you. Thank you. Well done. Well, Thank you very much. We'll keep on filming yeah. the market.